So uh, let's start in the front of the book, okay, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and um, I just want to say at the outset, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, and I understand the ramifications, and in fact, in this room, there's probably people are going to be uh, chuckling under their breath at some of what I say, and they'll, left, they'll leave here just scratching their head and said, what a whack job that guy is. But... Um, if we cannot trust God to tell the truth in the first book of the Bible, we cannot trust God the rest of the Bible either. If he did not tell us the truth in Genesis chapter 1, how in the world can we trust him for Revelation chapter 21? He's the same God, the same author, it's the same book. And I know it's not popular these days in academia or lots of places around the world in, in uh, science and the corporate world to talk about a creation ex nihilo, uh, out of nothing, by fiat. You know, our nation seems to be fine with creating money that way. But when it comes to God creating the whole universe that way, they say, oh, you guys are just, you're clowning around. Well, um, I'm not clowning around. I think we need to honor God's word. And I'd like to start with a little story. You know, we just had Flag Day a couple weeks ago, and Fourth uh, of July is coming up right around the corner. And um, I found myself being critical of one of my neighbors who he's hanging his uh, flag out there, and I, I appreciate that, but he never takes it down at night, and there's no light on it, and I just find myself being so judgmental. And uh, there is a way to treat our flag and um, I don't worship our flag. I don't worship our country. I worship God. But uh, we should honor this symbol. Um, it doesn't perhaps stand for what it once did. But we, uh, I'd like to share this story of this guy who took his children on a vacation to Fort McHenry. And uh, if you remember your history, that's where Francis Scott Key wrote our Star Spangled Banner National Anthem. And so he uh, went there to visit this um, fort, and he said, what really got my attention was the honor that the tour guide bestowed upon the flag. And he goes on to describe the scene, and he said the flag was uh, 30 feet wide and 40 feet long. So it was huge. And he said, um, the guide said it was 40 by 30. That's half the size of a basketball court. So when the flag came down, this gentleman and his family and hundreds of others were there at the uh, lowering of the flag, the guide asked the participants there, the people visiting, to help lower the flag and to take care of it. Um, why can't the flag touch the ground? This guide was very uh, adamant about, we've got to have enough people to hold this heavy flag without it touching the ground. And um, he says, why interrupt a few hundred people touring Fort McHenry so stitched cloth doesn't touch a well-manicured spotless lawn? Why not just let it down, fold it up, stuff it away, and put it back up tomorrow? Well, you should have heard the tour guide talk about the flag. You would have thought it was a delicate family heirloom. Not only did the tour guide beg us to be careful that the flag not touch the ground, but he also pleaded for us to be ambassadors for the Star Spangled Banner. He explained that professional singers, and he uses the word bastardized, the Star Spangled Banner by forgetting words or inserting sounds between words to bring attention to themselves instead of the song. He felt this was dishonorable to the flag and to the national anthem, and these performers lacked a certain awe or respect that the flag and the anthem were due. The tour guide went on for 20 minutes explaining exactly how to care for the flag and to fold it appropriately. He also recited every verse of the Star Spangled Banner and talked about the proper way to sing it. And the whole time, this father of four was asked, he had four questions. Am I going to go to hell for eating popcorn during the national anthem at the Yankees game? Second question, what would this tour guide do to me if I accidentally dropped my corner? Then he said, I wonder if the tour guide treats his wife as well as he treats this flag and honors her. And then one more question. 
Are people that careful when they read and interpret God's word? What we're going to be seeing this morning is the carelessness of people and God's word interpretation. And um, I'm going to be talking about um, creation versus evolution, but really I'm not going to deal with that side too much. You've heard the arguments. You're either convinced or you're not. And um, I'm not too concerned about that in this audience. What I am concerned about is the five views that I'm going to share with you are from Christians. People who say they believe in God, people who believe in the Bible, that it's inspired, it's inerrant, and yet they still have come up with these five theories that we'll be looking at in some detail today. So I'm going to just read again just two verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So if you, if you have your outline there that's in the bulletin, the yellow sheet, uh, just want to remind you a little bit uh, of what we talked about last week, just the first five words of the Bible. Um, in the beginning, God created. And we just stopped there, and we talked about that for probably way too long. <laughs> but... Um, Pantheism, atheism, polytheism, agnosticism, naturalism, all of those things are addressed just in those five words. In the beginning, God created. Now, um, I told you last week, if you were here, the Bible doesn't start with arguments for God's existence. It assumes that God exists. And I also told you that that doesn't mean there aren't arguments for God and his existence. It's just that the Bible doesn't start there. Um, I reduced it to here. I pieced together a syllogism in your notes. Um, since the cosmos is not eternal, and we talked about that last week just briefly, we know that uh, energy is running down and things are breaking down and diminishing. It's a scientific law. And that new energy and new matter is not being created, but what's available is kind of going down. So that argues against the universe being eternal. It had to have a starting point because it's going to have an ending point. The second thing, since something having a beginning cannot create itself, and that should be self-evident, people say, oh, you know, the Big Bang and this, that, and the other thing, and, and the universe created itself. That's a logical impossibility. For something to create itself, it has to exist and not exist at the same time. Impossible. So since something having a beginning cannot create itself, therefore a creator is necessary. Not optional, not possible, necessary. If something exists, something always had to exist superior to that thing that is existing and breaking down and falling apart and wearing out. And then finally, a necessary being cannot not exist or else he wouldn't be necessary. So kind of keep this in mind when you're talking to your friends who aren't convinced that God exists. Start with creation. What a wonderful place to start. The heavens declare the glory of God. And uh, the watchmaker idea that uh, if, you, if you stumble upon a watch, an intricate piece of machinery, you intuitively know there's somebody who made that watch. Well, the universe is much more complicated. Our human bodies are much more complicated than a watch. They had to have a maker. And that maker has chosen to reveal himself in the Bible. Shame on us for being careless and, and haphazard and dishonoring for not taking him at his word and coming up with some other ideas, trying to establish um, some kind of a cooperation between science as we have it today and Scripture as we've had it for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the white space between Genesis chapter 1-1 and Genesis chapter 1-2. Why? Because all of these theories that want to accommodate billions of years have to fit right there between 1-1 and 1-2. 
The argument is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Pause. The earth was formless and void. And so all of the so-called evolutionary science can be stuffed right in that white space. And then we can keep God happy by honoring his word, and we can keep scientists happy by honoring their theories. We don't have that luxury, folks. Um, on the back side, I made this so it would fit in your Bible. I just encourage you to do it. Um, probably on their own, none of these arguments would establish uh, the truth of existence of God to somebody who's denying it. But uh, together, they pack quite a wallop. And so stuff that in your Bible and uh, refer to it when you're talking to folks who uh, don't believe in the Bible or the Creator. So um, since this syllogism, I think, is true, ultimately we are faced with a conflict of process. The universe isn't eternal. That's pretty easy to establish. So therefore, the argument is God spoke it into existence, like he claims right here, or he used a process called evolution or called naturalism or called lots of things. And uh, those are the two options. He either used six 24-hour days, like he said, or he used vast ages and natural forces of random evolutionary development from simple to complex. Well, it's the only two options that I'm aware of. And it's really quite simple if you stick to the word of God, which one you should adopt. So quickly, five theories accommodating an old earth. <clears throat> Those uh, blue brackets there, all these five theories fit right there between 1-1 one, one and 1-2 one, if they fit anywhere at all. For thousands of years, God said, or 4,000 years ago, God said to Job, I will demand of thee and answer thou me if you can. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it if you have understanding. The stu stupendous impact of that question continues to the present day. You know, that's a good question for creationists also. None of you were there. Some of you, you look quite old, but you weren't there, right? Right? Uh, no human beings were there when this happened. No human beings observed creation at all, whether it's the creation of the Bible or the creation of natural processes. So what do we do? We look at evidence and we backtrack as best we can. And so uh, what has happened is that people have tried to sandwich in there their belief in the Bible and their belief in modern science. Well, it's problematic. The first one, which is really popular right now, I hear it on the radio a lot, the framework hypothesis. And what is that? Well, it's essentially an attempt to reclassify the genre of Genesis 1 as being something other than historical narrative. In fact, one of its contemporary adherents, uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, and this guy is a brilliant dude and uh, a great apologist and a wonderful Christian. I've watched him on uh, debates and stuff like that. It's great. But what he has done, he has accepted this idea that Genesis 1 through chapter 11 doesn't fit with modern science. And so to avoid sounding stupid, he comes up with a theory that would accommodate modern science and his belief in the Bible. Now, he didn't invent the framework hypothesis. He calls it mytho-historical. Proponents have attempted to identify figurative language or semi-poetic devices in the text, thinking they have successfully shown that the Bible's first 11 chapters are not to be taken in its plain sense. They make the claim that Genesis 1 simply reveals that God created everything, that he made man in his own image, but it gives us no information about how and when. Well, I'm going to suggest to you the Bible tells us exactly how he did it, and I think he tells us when he did it. So what is this mytho-historical? What's the problem that Dr. Craig has not resolved? Well, a core problem of viewing Genesis 1 through 11 as a myth. Now, he says it's authoritative. I'll, I'll grant him that. 
but he says it's a myth. Adam and Eve weren't real people. We just have a story put in the Bible that God created. But how and when and where and why, we have no clue. I don't accept that. Genesis is referred to over 200 times in the New Testament, 100 of these from chapters 1 through 11, six times out of those 100, six times Jesus Christ quotes from Genesis 1 through 11. What's the point? The point is, if Genesis 1 through 11 is a myth, why do the New Testament writers and our Lord Jesus Christ consider it historical? Adam is mentioned by name, not by concept, not by theories, by name. In Deuteronomy, 1 Chronicles, Job, Hosea, Romans, and 1 Corinthians. Noah is mentioned by name in 1 Chronicles, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Uh, he's also mentioned in the New Testament. Abraham is mentioned by name in 15 Old Testament and 11 New Testament books. Jacob is mentioned by name in 20 Old Testament and 17 New Testament books. Why is this important? All of these guys are from Genesis 1 through 11. Our Lord considered Adam and Eve historical people. In fact, when he was asked about marriage, he said from the start, and he talks about the start being Adam and Eve. So Dr. Craig not only has a problem with Genesis 1 through 11, he's got a problem with the rest of the Bible. Because the rest of the Bible considers 1 through 11 literal historical truth. <clears throat> the order of events is crucial here. If this is just a myth trying to teach us some concepts about God, if one rearranges the chronology, then it breaks down into absurdity. They say that it's not chronological, it's theological. And so don't get hung up on six days and what happened on the first day, what happened on the second day. Actually, you have to consider the chronology. The waters of day one must exist for them to be separated on day two. That's common sense. On day three, the dry land appeared out of those waters. They had to exist before the land could come out of them. The sun, moon, and stars of day four were placed in the heavens of day two. The birds of day five flew in the face of the firmament on day two and multiplied on the land of day three. And finally, mankind was made to rule over all of creation, day six. Any attempt to rearrange days of the creation week forces impossibilities into the text. That's why I say... And Dr. Craig uh, and others that hold some of these views, um, they believe in the inspiration of Scripture. They believe in the Bible as God's Word. But, and I don't want to suggest they are dishonoring His Word, but that's kind of what it sounds like. When God says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and someone comes along thousands of years later and say, well, He didn't really mean that. I think that's dishonoring God and his word. And we'll talk about that more in a second. The theistic evolution, you've heard about this. It's been around for a long time. Theistic. God used the process of evolution to create Adam and Eve. There has been an explosion in the intensity of the conversation regarding the creation evolution debate in the last few years. It would make sense that the intensity of this discussion would continue to elevate between the world and the church. I don't have a problem that people that would just be honest and say, I don't believe in the Bible and I don't believe in the God in the Bible and I have this other viewpoint. Well, then, okay, we can talk about that. But this is coming from inside the church. It's coming from Christians, well-known, popular, persuasive, influential Christians who are rejecting the literal interpretation of the Bible. If you reject it here in Genesis chapter 1, you've got no business talking about a coming kingdom and heaven and hell and all this final judgment and the resurrection in the end. If you can't trust it here, you can't trust it there. So that's not where the fire is raging. The flames are being stoked by those within evangelical circles. 
Not only are many demanding that Christians must embrace evolution in its various forms, some are also demanding that Adam and Eve were either evolved from ape-like creatures or that they did not even exist. These are the issues involved in the discussion surrounding theistic evolution. Cosmological, geological, biological. Theistic evolution says God used natural processes in all of these categories to bring about what we see today. A related theory, progressive creationism, such as Dr. Uh, Hugh Ross, um, Robert Newman, some others, they profess faith in the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible and reject more radical views such as theistic evolution but nevertheless, believe also in the timetable of the Big Bang cosmology. They believe that millions of years separated the miraculous appearance of the various kinds of living things. Now, I don't have time to address all that evidence, but I'm trying to bring to your awareness that there are Christians adopting a naturalistic view of what we see around us instead of taking a literal interpretation of the Bible. A major problem with progressive creationism is its insistence that animals, and even a pre-Adamic race of men, died long before Adam sinned. The reason why the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth and together until now, and has been placed into bondage by God, because God subjected the creation to the curse at the time of Adam's rebellion. Thus, there could have been no death in the animal kingdom before the fall and the curse. Any view that tries to sandwich millions of years of life and death and evolution into creation before Adam sinned is contrary to the word of God. No death existed before Adam sinned. That's what the scripture says. If you have an argument, uh, it's with the Bible, it's not with me. Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Dan had a discussion in the previous hour in the adult Sunday school class about why did Christ die? Well, that's why. Every human born is under the sentence of death because of what our first dad did. He represented the human race. He disobeyed God, and he died spiritually immediately. He started to die physically, and he uh, passed that on to all subsequent generations. How do we know? Romans chapter 5, verse 12, as well as some other places. So this idea of millions of years of chaos and turmoil and violence among animals eating each other violates scripture. Now, I'm not saying that uh, after the curse, after the fall of man, that uh, nature was, was mild. Oh, yeah, it was violent. But it didn't happen millions of years between 1-1 and 1-2. It happened after Genesis chapter 3 in the fall of man. God cursed, Romans chapter 8, he cursed the entire creation why do we have killer storms? Why do we have earthquakes? Why do we have this? Why do we have that? Why do we have pandemics? Why do we have disease? Why do we have violence in the streets? Why do we have hatred and bigotry and racism? Because of sin. The day-age theory. The day-age theory attempts to reconcile the Genesis creation narrative and modern science by asserting that the creation days were not ordinary 24 hours, but they were ages. Well, then you've got problems that uh, plant life lived for ages before there was a sun. Uh, just the chronology is messed up. And again, it's an attempt by people who want to wed the Bible to evolutionary science. They think they found a way. Well, let's just don't call these 24-hour days. Let's call them ages and the problem solved. No, it's not. The problem persists. The gap theory. Now, there are two types of gaps. 
Um, <clears throat> Dr. Schofield and Dr. Fruchtenbaum have uh, two different views there. The first one, again, all the evolutionary science we see, all the uh, paleontology, all the fossils, all this, all the plate tectonics, all this stuff that's going on can be fit between 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, that's the gap theory, historical. The gap between those two verses can accommodate all of what we see in the chronology of uh, radiometric dating and all the fossils and the rocks and blah, 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 blah. The other gap theory is that Dr. Fruchtenbaum says there had to be a time where Satan rebelled in heaven and he showed up in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve. He was evil. He was kicked out of heaven. And Dr. Fruchtenbaum says that happened between 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, and it resulted in a, an earth that was chaotic, formless, void, dark. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. I don't have quite as much a problem with that view. You got to put Satan's fall in there somewhere. But it didn't have to result in a chaotic world, and it didn't have to result in millions and millions of years of evolution. Satan was judged, kicked out of heaven. He showed up somewhere in the garden to attempt, uh, to attempt Adam and Eve. That's biblical. But man, you can't stretch that too far. So those are the five theories accommodating an old earth. They, they're from Christians, and they're trying to squeeze evolutionary science into the biblical revelation. I'm going to give you five reasons why I don't believe in an old, millions of years old universe. First of all, God's language excludes this millions of years evolution. When I'm talking about evolution, I'm talking about the millions of years of uh, chaotic, random processes that uh, life went from simple to complex. I don't have a problem with microevolution change within a species, within a kind. You know, chihuahuas and Great Danes, uh, they're still canines, right? They're dogs. They never become orangutans. They're dogs. But they've, you can breed changes, and changes over time, and changes in environment can impact kinds. I don't have a problem with that. But there is no record in the Bible where God accommodates change from one kind to another, macroevolution. So God's language, we talked about this a little bit last week. Let there be light. And God saw that there was good, uh, the light was good. Another thing here, this, uh, this idea of God watching millions of years of violence in the animal world, killing each other, and he would pronounce it good? I don't think so. He pronounced it good when he created it. And then in verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. How can you make it any more clear in the language that God is talking about a literal 24-hour period? Half is light, half is dark. There's evening, there's morning, and oh, well, there's the first day, the second day, third day. Ages don't start with morning and evening. Ages don't start with light and dark. Days do. And so the language of God, and he called it good. And uh, he goes all the way down through six days. And when he gets to Adam and Eve and he makes them, he says it's very good. No sin before Adam and Eve were created. No sin before they messed up in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. So therefore, since Romans 5.12 is true, since there's no sin before this time, there is no death. Zero. Psalm 33, the language here, five reasons supporting a young earth. Well, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth... For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Now, you either believe that or you don't. But if, if we postulate, as we did last week, an all-powerful, all-wise, omnipresent, holy God, I don't have a problem with 
if he created something, he could do it in an instant by speaking it into existence. He doesn't have to get out modeling clay and work things around and say, man, oh, sh smash that one. It didn't turn out right. Let's try plan B. No, God gets it right the first time by speaking. That's how powerful he is. Well, I had to throw this in there just for fun. Uh, I'm kind of a Gary Larson fan, and he is crazy, certifiably nuts. But I think, <laughs> and I don't mean to dishonor God here, but uh, he made the herbivores, and then um, it's not like he scratched his head and said, well, they might, be, uh, they might multiply too much. I better come up with somebody to kill them. No. God said right from the start, his plan was perfect. All of his creation was done in six days, and he pronounced it very good. It's not like, oh, that didn't work. I'm going to try something else. That's not God. The language of God doesn't allow for that. The scientific observation excludes evolution. Observation. Science is built on observation, especially if it's uh, uh, open to falsification, if, if you can test it. I don't have a problem with science. I appreciate science. I think we should all appreciate science. Why? Because God, who made us, made scientific laws and how we can operate. You know, how in the world can we shoot off a rocket in Houston and land some guys in the moon? Well, because we knew where that moon was going to be. Why? Because there's laws that govern those kinds of things. And if there's laws, there has to be a lawgiver. And that's my God. Many experiments have attempted to duplicate some form of evolutionary change, but none have ever come close to evolving anything in the laboratory. It's not observable. There are big dogs and little dogs, but there are no dogs becoming something higher. Natural selection tends to be a conservative process. The hopeful monster idea where suddenly there's a, some kind of a, a genetic defect. It turns into something wonderful. This doesn't happen. Defects tend to get weeded out. Why? Because they're imperfect. They're mistakes. They're genetic mistakes. So they tend to be a conservative process that chooses from what already exists. Natural selection doesn't create anything. It's powerless to create. The best it can do is to get rid of the weak ones. I don't have a problem with that. Scientific observation excludes evolution. Scientific uh, forensics or historical uh, excludes evolution. To demonstrate that simple life forms have evolved into more complex life forms, evolutionists must demonstrate it historically by producing examples. We should have not just, not just the missing link. We should have a long chain of links showing transitional forms from this lower life to this more complex one. What do we see in the record? None of that. We see in the record a sudden explosion between the Precambrian and the Cambrian, a sudden explosion of complex life form. The trilobite is the index fossil for the Cambrian layer. What is the trilobite? It's a complex little marine animal with eyes better than you have. In the Precambrian, it didn't exist. In the Cambrian, suddenly it's, there's so many of them, it's the index fossil for that layer. There was no life, then suddenly there was life in the record. God's character excludes evolution, not just his language, the way he told us. His character, he's not a liar. He is holy. And if he says he created in six days, who in the world do we think we are to say, no, you didn't? Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterance to the end of the world. The heavens. Just by seeing the incredible creation around us, we should say, man, there's got to be a creator. And he must be really smart. Powerful. He knows all things. He can speak things into existence. 
You know, that's another thing. We tend to disrespect God's word. Look what Jesus did. Jesus, the son of God, he turned water into wine. What, what did he do there? Did he use millions of years? He spoke. Go fill up those pots and then test it. <laughs> wow, this is good. He healed people. In fact, Dan talked about that in Sunday school today too. A guy that was for 40 years couldn't walk. And God empowered Peter and James and John and these disciples, these apostles. And uh, they told the guy, I'm not going to give you any money. I don't have any. But what I do have, I offer to you. And they grabbed his hand and he leapt to his feet, legs that he had never used in 40 years. And the people around there couldn't deny there was a miracle. They still wanted to kill the apostles, and they wanted to do away with that guy, and they denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but that guy was standing right in front of them. They knew him. How did God do that? He didn't use a process, didn't use surgery. Didn't, he just spoke through these apostles and demonstrated his power. Psalm 139, the character of God, not only is he holy, and not only is, look, he's, he's omnipresent. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you're there too. That's Psalm 139. So uh, important today as we, um, I would say, celebrate uh, the Supreme Court finally getting it right and recognizing there is no constitutional right to kill your baby. Psalm 139. God was intimately involved, intricately weaving us together in our mother's womb. And from before we were born, he knew us. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, before Jeremiah was born, God saw him in the womb and called him. Galatians chapter 1, 15, same thing with Paul. I knew you before you were born. The unborn have personhood and infinite value. God, forgive us for 50 years, deliberately killing a million a year. People wonder if America's under the judgment of God. How could we not be? And then we try to come up with theories to explain him away. He's our only hope. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. As far back as you go, God was there. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. There's no exceptions. Like some of the world evolved, and some of it was by random chance. No, everything that came into being came into being through Jesus Christ, the creator. So God's character excludes evolution. God's purpose. Why did he make the world? For his own glory. Revelation 4.11, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. So these guys, they don't only have a problem with Genesis chapter 1 through 11, they've got a problem with the rest of the Bible that calls God the creator. And he did it for his glory. And he will be vindicated. And the day is coming where every knee will bow and every tongue confess, Thou art the God. And He is the image, again, Jesus, of the invisible God. You want to know what God looked like? Look, read the Bible. What, what was Jesus like? He is the image of His Father. God demonstrated His glory in the creation, but He got personal with Jesus. He sent him here among the human race to live and to die so we would have 
renewed fellowship with him, what Adam and Eve forfeited thousands of years ago in the garden. He's, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth. So that's all things. Not some things, all things. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. So that identifies him as Jesus. And, um, you know, science is an amazing thing. I wish I knew more about it. But I know that inside the atom, there's some pressure going on in there. <laughs> you mess with that, it blows up. What holds it together? The, the positives and the negatives under such extreme pressure. Well, it says here, Jesus holds all things together. And all he has to do is to withdraw from creation for a second and judgment blows us up. <clears throat> you know, some of these guys say, well, you know, uh, you, you funny mentalists, uh, you, uh, you don't realize that in the genealogies back there in Genesis 1 to 11, it says so-and-so begat so-and-so, if you use the King James, or it became the father of. And, you know, there's, there could be just thousands of generations in there that you don't account for. So, you, you know, this silly idea that Bishop Usher came up with, 4004 B.C., the creation of the world, you guys are just crazy because all these genealogies have gaps. They could extend for millions of years. No, they can't. That's about silly. These uh, generations, these 10 uh, patriarchs, they all have time stamps. You cannot extend, I don't care how many generations you put in there, the start and the end of these guys is counted for us. Have you ever thought about that? There's a time stamp. We know exactly when Noah was born. We know how long he lived. We know when his children were born. We know uh, how old he was when the flood started. You cannot extend these generations for indefinite periods. God won't allow us to do that with his scriptures. All these guys. <laughs> the age before having, I, I put here in the slide, the first son. It really should be um, the named son. Because, for example, Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Seth wasn't his first son. So Seth is the son that God is dealing with. He's going to trace him out in this genealogy. But Adam lived 130 years and had a son named Seth. Then uh, after he had this son named Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years. Not ages, not thousands of years, 800 years. So all the days, they give us a total. Thank you, Genesis. All the days that Adam lived were 930, and he died. You say, well, so what? Because all the other guys are connected to those time stamps. You cannot extend the genealogies indefinitely. Not everybody's named in there, but we have ages before the first son, at the time of death, and the total, in this case, is Adam. Seth lived 105 year, years, had a son. Lived 807 years after the son. Total age, just add him up, 912. Enoch, well, he, yeah, that guy. He was 90 years old when he had his first kid. He lived 815 years after that. Total 905 years. Methuselah, way down number eight, <clears throat> he waited, he postponed having children. Okay, 187 years before his first son or his named son. Then he lived 782 years after that. Maybe there's a connection. Postpone having kids, you'll live longer. I don't know. He lived 969 years. Noah, he was 500 years old when um, he had this son that God is going to trace out here. 
After that, he lived another 450. So he lived 950 years. Then we know when the flood happened, right? So you can't go back too far, millions of years. The genealogies won't let us. They have a time stamp to start and a time stamp to end. Why don't we just take God at his word? That's what I recommend. You say you believe in the inspiration of scripture. You want to interpret the Bible literally? Great. You're going to come out with the idea that God created in six days. 24 hours. He didn't need that much time. He could have done it a lot quicker. But he's teaching a progression here. And he's showing us how he did it. He tells us why he did it for his glory. He tells us how he's going to end it. Theories accommodating an old earth ignore a clear interpretation of Scripture, and they substitute a disjointed presentation of billions of years. There's no evidence in here, and I would submit to you there's no evidence out in the world of billions of years. Um, maybe you're going to come up with a sixth theory that will accommodate billions of years in the Word of God, but these five fail miserably. And unfortunately, they're from our friends. That hurts. They've bought into the idea evolution is obviously true, and anybody to question it has rocks in their head. And so to try to accommodate God's Word and that world view they fabricate these ideas God's language the science around us the science behind us God's character God's purpose will not allow that the word of God can be trusted there is never a conflict between an accurate interpretation of scripture and what real science demonstrates Science is our friend. Science corroborates what God has told us. Way before science caught up to it, the book of Job told us the world was round. Way before science caught up to it, the, book, the Bible told us that the earth revolves around the sun, not the other way. Science has been wrong for so long on so many cases, why in the world do we elevate it above God's word now? Someone shared in the Sunday school hour, <clears throat> there is some evidence for a flat earth, and um, that's Nebraska. <clears throat> but if those guys get out of sight Nebraska, they'll see the earth is not flat. Well, let's close with a song. Thank you.